Thanks very much for joining us for episode 31 of In Tech Freight and Logistics, the podcast. I'm Kevin Baxter, and I'm joined by my co-host for this edition, In Tech CEO Rick Lador. Hey, hey, Rick. Hey there. Welcome to the video world. Yes, our first one. Yes, and our guest today is uh, a returning guest of ours, Ari Ash. Um, so let's let's do a little bit of an intro first. So Intermodal is is noted for the uh, savings it offers to shippers' bottom lines, but some have reservations about service compared to truck. And uh, Ari, with the Journal of Commerce, not only monitors how the savings stack up versus over the road on an ongoing basis with the quarterly Intermodal Savings Index. But he also addresses service with the help of actual customers with the Intermodal Service Scorecard, both of which we'll discuss on this episode. Ari, thanks very much for joining us. Happy to do it. And thanks for uh, the inaugural uh, video podcast of ours as well. <laughs> how, to, how to get the nice shirt on uh, after doing it for four or five consecutive days at TPM. All good. <laughs> Uh, so speaking of that, uh, that's a that's a good place to start. So as we record this, TPM was just last week. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the conference for those who are unfamiliar. Rick and Shelley uh, Austin, our president, also attended. Um, so tell us a little bit about TPM and uh, and how it went. So TPM is one of the two conferences that we do at the Journal of Commerce. TPM has been around for more than 20 years now, and it's really the premier event for the international uh, uh, ocean side of things. And so a lot of coverage over the ports and what's going on in Trans-Pacific and Transatlantic uh, ocean freight, what's going on in the ports. Inland a little bit, we talk about certainly the IPI portion of the rail intact portion of ocean containers, but basically anything that has to do with a 2040 or 45 international container is something we tackle at this conference. It is well attended. We had almost 4,000 people at this uh, event um, at the beginning of March. And one of the reasons why it is a well attended event, besides the great content, uh, where we really go into the granular details of what's going on in the international space and why the BCOs need to care about these granular details, is also the meetings. It's really the place where the ocean carriers get to meet with the BCOs and, and do those negotiations uh, for the contracts, because a lot of contracts in the international space are usually signed at some point in March and usually go effective in uh, early April or early May. And so TPM is an ideal place where a lot of the BCOs and the international ocean carriers, whether they're Asian or European, come to meet in one location in Southern California to hash out the terms. So there's a lot of business that also gets done at TPM besides the great content that we provide. Yeah, and as an IMC, like an Intec, we have the opportunity to um, meet with the railroads and there are a ton of dray carriers out there to help consider um, and and work on contracts as well and, and work on potential solutions and introduce them to um, our customers. As I was telling you earlier, we spent uh, the two days after the conference just meeting up with customers in, in the uh, Long Beach area. So it's a great conference. Yeah, we, we uh, this time around had five of the six class ones, both of our events. Of both TPM and, and our inland conference in late September in Chicago. Uh, we really make it a priority to try and have it be a, a venue where, whether it's the ocean carriers or the railroads, that it's not just the trucking community, it's not just the shipper slash BCO community, but it's also the railroads or the ocean carriers in the case of TPM, so that all the stakeholders are in one room together to talk about issues. And speaking of issues, I mean, there's there's obviously a timely one uh, relating to ocean freight uh, with the uh, the Red Sea. Um, how is that addressed? How did people feel about that? And how, how did how do the carriers seem to be uh, responding? I think that there first off, there's no evidence yet of a migration to the West Coast. I think there's some that believe, and including if I read between the lines, Union Pacific Railroad, that once some of these contracts do go into effect in early April and early May, that we might see some of that migration. But I'm not seeing any of it yet. If we were to see it, I think we would very much see it in the AAR data, where we would see originations from the two Western railroads, BNSF and UP, go up. And then in the east, we would see the originations from CSX and Norfolk Southern going down, but their received number would go up. And so I tracked that 
that market share between originations and received every single week. And there is absolutely no evidence right now that there's any tor- uh, sort of shift of to the West and a boost in received, but a decline in originated from the East Coast. If nothing, they're all going up across the board. And a perfect example of that would be that the Georgia Ports Authority announced double digit intermodal growth um, from the Port of Savannah to Atlanta, to Memphis, to Nashville, uh, to the Appalachian Regional Port in Northwest Georgia. And we're talking north of 20, 30, 40% in certain cases. So, you know, if there was a migration from the Red Sea to the West Coast, we would not be seeing the type of robust intermodal numbers that we're seeing right now out of the Port of Savannah. So that tells me, in addition to the AAR data, that if there is a migration, it certainly hasn't happened yet. The only other thing I would add to that is I just actually spoke to a shipper recently about this very question. And what she said to me was that she's only going to move stuff to the West Coast that's stuff that's time urgent, which has always been the case for the West Coast. Um, So it's not a particularly new thing, but uh, to the extent that she has cargo that uh, is not time sensitive, all they're doing is building into their supply chain that is opposed to 40 days uh, to the East Coast. Now they're they're building out 55 days, but they're building out their supply chain knowing that extra tan- transit time's in there. So unless that piece of freight is super urgent, shippers are making the adjustment in terms of their supply chain on the increased transit time because of the issues in the Red Sea. Yeah, what, one of the, I'll just add on to this a little bit. So at the, um, the last um, setting, so as the lunch and learn with Lars, um, he was speaking about uh, that, that was his first topic in terms of the Red Sea. And what he was mentioning was is that um, with all the uh, additional capacity that the uh, ocean carriers put on over the pandemic, they created, well, this additional capacity is what has, has allowed no real issue associated with um, the Red Sea because that's it's always gotten sucked up through that going going south of um, or the southern tip of Africa and going around. He mm-hmm. did mention, though, that he said there's two things to watch out for, and that the two things that he mentioned were, well, if there's another disruption, the capacity has been eaten up um, through going around um, Africa, and then so that could cause a problem. Um, and the other thing he mentioned is that as soon as that opens up, if it does open up, the Red Sea gets um, resituated and, and figured out. Um, there's going to be possibly an imbalance that will occur because as soon as it becomes a, a safe area for for the ships to go travel, his his expectation is is that those ships are immediately going to go um, through the Suez Canal and uh, then will create an imbalance because you're going to have delay still going around the, um, the Cape. And then, and then you're going to have all this other freight go uh, straight through Suez. So, uh, those were two watch outs that he had. That was one of the uh, Lars has usually has one of the better pieces Rick, out there. Rick, the other thing I hear, and it's really similar to what you've told me from the domestic intermodal side, is that shippers just want consistency in terms of a low standard of deviation between various sailings, or in the case of railroads, uh, you know, routings on the train, and so. You know, what I hear all the time, you know, from you guys is, you know, if that train is going to be scheduled at four days, but it always arrives five, as long as it always arrives five, 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 you can plan that final mile off of a predictable transit time. It's no different in the ocean space where the BCOs I speak to say, so long as it, it it's consistently at a number, 40 versus 55 doesn't matter. We can make the changes. We just need to have a number that stays consistent. Very true. Very true. So, uh, aside from the Red Sea issue, you you mentioned you have you know, a pretty good cross section of the industry there. So, uh, Rick, you we already talked a little bit about how you read the mood, and <laughs> I'm curious to to hear uh, Ari, what, what did you feel the the general mood was in terms of you know the state of uh, of freight? I think there's certainly a lot of uncertainty about what will happen with the Red Sea and what does it mean for rates. I'm of the mindset that there probably will be, and I think this was the the feeling there, maybe a little bit of a rate increase uh, for the the contracts currently under negotiation. Uh, Volume is up. So I'm not sure that there's a case for the shipper to still say, 
we're not going to pay an increase. Now, is there a case for the ocean carrier to say that we can raise rates, you know, 30%? Probably not. Um, if they were paying, and I'll just throw out a hypothetical because I don't want to create an antitrust violation, but if you're paying roughly, <laughs> let's say, 1500 from Shanghai to the U.S. West Coast, is there a scenario where that could that could go up into 1800, 1900, 2000, 2100? Sure. But it's not necessarily a market where just because the, the, the volume's up that they're going to be able to do like 4,000 or 5,000. That, that's certainly not the case. And so I think the mood out of it was we don't know what the impact will be. There's a little bit of uncertainty going on right now. The shippers are okay if they have to accept a little bit of an increase, but not necessarily a significant increase in any way. And how about, how about more broadly with... Um you know, the, the freight recession, um, where it stands right now, uh, are people seeing, um, any improvement there or is that still looking like it's, uh, drifting out, uh, towards the end of the year or beginning of next year when things might get more normal? So I think there's two parts to that question. One being, I guess, how do we define a turnaround? I think a lot of us got very jaded, and I'm thinking of a domestic intermodal example. Larry Gross has talked about what really is the peak season in domestic intermodal and to what extent will we get jaded by what happened in 2020 and 21, and somewhere in our brain conflated what a peak season is really supposed to look like with those two very major outliers. And so similarly in this respect, um, what is a turnaround in the ocean space? What's a turnaround in international intermodal? What's a turnaround in domestic intermodal? Maybe it's not the type of numbers that are in our heads right now because we're trying to compare to a, a market which we had never seen before and maybe a long time before we ever see again. So to the extent that we're seeing, you know, plus, but right now, plus double digits, of course, in, in international intermodal, but from the port officials, you know, the port authority seeing positive high single digits or low double digits, even if it were positive mid single digits, to me, that maybe is a realistic view of what a turnaround looks like. I've used the phrase less bad, but maybe it's not less bad. Maybe that is what a turnaround will look like if we shed ourselves of sort of the expectations of what a rebound is supposed to look like based on maybe a very jaded outlier of 2020 and 21 and even maybe the early part of 2022. I'd agree. We've actually gone back to analyzing our business based off of 2019 as the baseline, um, which removes everything that was in the pandemic because that was, it, it was crazy times. And, and if you take a look at that, a lot of people are up significant numbers. I know our, us, and when you're comparing, um, Last year, we were up uh, over 65% when you're comparing 2019 numbers. So if you would consider just as you're speaking, if you're just considering just normal-ish uh, type growth between those other years, that that's still a great, that's still great growth. Um, but they, and I would agree that there's a this jaded thought that, you know, things are going to take off and, and we're going to start seeing some huge volumes because the, the, the general feel that I got is there's a lot of people that have been saying huge recovery in the first half of the year and more of the conversation was, you know, it's going to be more of the same single digit type growth. And if we're going to see some growth um, in volumes, it probably wouldn't happen um, until later um, in the fourth quarter of this year and then say maybe see some more price stability and, and strength and um, first quarter 2025 is kind of the gist I heard from a lot of the carriers that we were speaking with. The only difference I would say, Rick, between now and indexing to 19, which I think is a very fair way of going about it, is the capacity side of things. Whether oh, yeah. it's the ocean, Absolutely. as you mentioned before, a lot more capacity. But even even in our domestic intermodal world, you know, the amount of containers that that Schneider has stacked, Hub has stacked. I'm throwing out JB Hunt because I'm not sure what what the Walmart thing will do in terms of their oh, their right. containers, but historically what J.B. Hunt had stacked, or for the fact that during my TPM trip, I went over to uh, uh, LATC, Union Pacific's, one of the Union Pacific's terminals in Southern California. They had probably between the UMAXs and EMPs, probably a thousand containers. And that's a small number, I think, relative to other parts of the country, but a thousand rail-owned containers just sitting in stacks. Will right. they be able to unstack some of them? For sure. But 
the 29 baseline doesn't also take into account supply and demand and the fact that the uh, the railroads but more importantly the private asset guys and the ocean carriers really beefed up their supply side in reaction to what happened yeah. and now we may see a maybe return to 2019 type of growth but off of a supply that's much more tailored towards that exuberance of freight surges after the uh, initial wave of the pandemic. Absolutely. Good point. So uh, the intermodal savings index, is that that's uh, obviously one way that you measure how things are going with actual uh, numbers. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how it came about, uh, how you put it together and, uh, and what the latest ones say. Sure. So the way it really started was to me, when I started to really get into intermodal, it was always about you can't cover domestic intermodal without knowing what trucking is about. As Rick often says, pricing gets you in the door and, and service keeps you there. And so knowing that pricing gets you in the door, well, I mean, you need to know what the price is. And and slowly mm -hmm. but surely, you know, when I started this almost six years ago at this point, it was that we have great great data out there on the trucking side, whether it's DAT or truck stop or load smart or cargo chief or whatever the, or even, you know, JB Hunt 360 or Schneider freight power, whatever freight quote, whatever port it may be. There is a lot of good trucking data out there. Even today, outside of me, there really is no DAT of intermodal. So to be able to get you in the door, you need to be able to have the price on both intermodal and, and truckload. And the fact that it didn't exist in intermodal was a big problem. And so to me, the very obvious answer was, okay, well, how can I fix that? How can I build that out? Forming relationships with IMC such yourself. So what we do now is we, every single month, we pull uh, spot market trend, the spot market data for intermodal, spot market data for the truckload industry, contract, uh, information for the intermodal space and contract truckload data. So four data points in all every month. And we do uh, 120 lanes, which was initially based on uh, the lanes that you, Rick, were, were pulling historically. And I've kept some of the ones that obviously went by the wayside, but we, we use that as a baseline. Um, and, and so we have 120 lanes there. And every month we're just running the comps between spot truckload, spot intermodal, contract truckload, contract intermodal, calculating an index value based off of a base of 100 on how much each lane is saving. And then we weight it, uh, we weight it for one each region and then two weight it on a national basis using uh, IANA's figures so that we properly give the, the weighting to an LA to Chicago lane or Chicago to LA weighting versus a, I'll pick one in the index, Rick, that you, you used to pull Syracuse to Orlando which, you know, right. that does very little volume. So it would be unfair in an index that's meant to explain to the shipper what intermodal saves to give Syracuse to Orlando the same type of weighting that LA to Chicago gets. So we weight it in that way. And then to your question, Kevin, in terms of what, are, what we see is that historically the contract intermodal index has been very, very steady. Yes, during the, the freight surge, there was a, certainly a case where intermodal was saving you know, 30, 40% nationally. Now that was an outlier, but historically we know over the last almost 10 years at this point that domestic intermodal saves roughly in the ballpark of 25 to 28% nationally on a weighted basis for intermodal shippers. Choosing domestic intermodal rather than picking over the road, uh, truckload, full truckload. And, and then of course it, you know, depends on the various lanes. So certainly LA to Chicago, is been historically a lot higher than that 25 to 28%. That's a lane where it's a bread and butter lane for the railroads and for the IMC community. And so regularly that lane probably saves 35 to 45%. But then there are lanes in there, which certainly is an important part of this index to also let shippers know where it does not make sense to be running intermodal. And so you've got a local a local east lane, um, you know, that, that you know, there are a couple couple local east lanes that never make sense. Um, you know, one I can think of, it's not necessarily local east, but let's say Jacksonville to Dallas seems to never be a lane where truck load, where, where the intermodal is ever really able to compete pricing wise, or LA to Denver, or LA to Seattle. Um, these are the types of lanes where 
that index value tends to be below that 25 to 28 percent. So the index is not only important for you guys to be able and shippers to know how much money they can actually save using 53 foot intermodal as opposed to a, a dry van truckload move, but also to know where it makes sense and where it doesn't make sense so that you're not wasting your money on a mode that's slower and then not even saving any money on top of it. Right. So uh, the, the latest one just came out a few weeks ago. What's uh, How has it sort of mirrored what we've been talking about in terms of the uh, the freight uh, overall freight situation in terms of the differences between uh, truck and intermodal? Well, right now at this point, the index itself has been pretty steady for the last six to eight months. We had this period in 22, sort of when we were all in Chicago in 22, uh, in late September 22, where it was getting a little dicey and, and truckload was getting really competitive to the intermodal space and things were tightening. But I would say for at least the last six to eight months, if not longer, it's been pretty steady in terms of spot intermodal saving a good 15 to 20% and the contract saving 25 to 28%. Um, and, and the reason it's not moving is because neither of the markets are really moving much right now. I just pulled the, the February numbers uh, that that I'll be sending out momentarily uh, to a partner such as yourself. And the the trucking numbers haven't moved. Spot contract, they're pretty much just hanging in there. It went down actually in February on the spot side. But they're pretty much just balancing where they've been over the last six to eight months. And therefore, the intermodal space is roughly bouncing where it is. It went up a little bit in February on the spot side, went up down a little bit on the intermodal contract side, but just keeps bouncing. And so to the extent that continues, I don't see an environment yet where, at least on the contract side, that the rates do much of anything on a year-over-year -year basis. My, my data at this point from intermodal contracts suggests maybe on the worst end, you get minus two to minus four if you're a shipper, but in certain lanes, it's very flattish. And so it's really just not much rate movement in either direction, either in trucking or intermodal at this point. It's been a super long flat period, longest I recall yeah. seeing you know, since we've been tracking this information back to 2010. Yeah, I, I, an example I would give, and I want to avoid giving precise numbers, but LA to Chicago, again, I, I picked that lane because that's the busiest corridor, obviously, in, in intermodal. And so the, the, the rate I have right now for the standard intermodal contract is pretty much where it was a year ago at this time. It's not really up. It's not really down. It's pretty much exactly where it was 12 months ago. Right. And a lot of that plays into the capacity that we were talking about earlier. There's just so much capacity out there, both on the truckload side and the intermodal side, that uh, either some of it needs to, some of the capacity needs to re get removed from the market, or we've got to see volume increases from the shipper side or a combination of both until we actually see some strength in the price. But for right now, it, you're right. It, it certainly is. A, it is a supply side. I mean, you have, again, not knowing what will happen, but, this, you know, over the last six to eight months, we could safely say that J.B. Hunt was storing at least 15,000 containers. Well, they've never given a precise figure. That's more right. of an estimate for me than anything else. But we know that, you know, they're probably at roughly 15,000 containers in the stack at any certain point in, in 23, and, and Schneider at 4,000, and Hub probably in the 7,500 range. And so then the question becomes, you know, if you have plus 3% on volume, what does that really mean for the stack? That's not enough to unstack everything. And so then again, we get into the supply and demand situation where maybe it is more of a normalized environment based off of 2019 being the normal rather than the post-pandemic freight surge. But at the same time, that's not enough volume to unstack uh, 15,500 containers for J.D. Hunt or uh, or 4,000 for Schneider or 7,500 for Hub, that, 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 you know, 3% is not enough volume to do that. Right. And one of the charts that you have in the savings uh, report talks about the, the turn of those containers and the yes. turn is still down pretty significantly. So the, the, uh, the incentive to bring those back into the market is it's not there yet because it's, the turn is so um, in fact, significantly in, down. Rick, I even did some of the math on it. I, so I said, what would, Schneider need to do in terms of volume in order to unstack 
all of their, again, roughly 4,000 containers. And I based that off the idea that that they have said publicly that they're at about 15% stacked. And we know that they have uh, roughly 28,000 containers. Uh, so, so that gets us to the 4,000 figure. So if you were to just assume that they want to have, an, and I use a very low number, a 1.5% 1.5 box turn ratio, which you know is very low. I mean, you want 18192 is really more ideal. But even at 1.5, if you were to unstack all 4,000, you would need like a growth rate of, I think I did the math, at least 20% year over year for them to justify unstacking every single container in 2024 and getting the revenue over a 12 month basis that you need for that container. That is not going to happen. That will never right. happen. So will companies like Schneider and Hub and, and JB Hunt and even like a COFC, Gary Old at COFC, will they be able to unstack the containers that they have piling up? Sure, but it's not going to be a 12 month proposition. To me, it's going to take 18 months at least. Right, right. We need a new container home trend or something, <laughs> right? So, something else to use them for. Um, so, uh, you know, you mentioned the price gets you in the door, service keeps you. Uh, and so even within the ISI, you do have some some info about service uh, in terms of rail intermodal. How, how has that been looking? I think it's been sort of improving over the last, uh, you know, year or so. Yeah. So we, we pull, you know, pretty much the data that gets reported to the AAR and the STB. Um, what we've done, which is unique and, and our gold subscribers for the Journal of Commerce get access to this data is that, that I've de delved into the data and, and now mm -hmm. taking some of these metrics like intermodal trains holding or intermodal rail cars that idle for more than 28, 24, excuse me, 48 hours. And I really parsed into the data and said, okay, what is normal? And if you put up year by year by year, and you put 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2023 together, the lines for those two metrics over 52 weeks looks remarkably similar, week after week after week. So that tells me 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2023 is normal, is what rail should be. And then if you can take the worst value out of 2020, 21, and 22, you get to be able to build out what really happened in the pandemic. And so one of the charts I update every week and look at is, okay, We've got a line of what normal is, four years worth of normal. We have one line that's for the pandemic, blending the worst of that two and a half year period. And then we have a third line of current year. Each week we update that number and we see, is that number trending towards the normal line? Or is that number veering off the normal line and heading towards some of those pandemic numbers? And so that hopefully in real time will start to show us if service does start to fall apart, from metrics that are reported every week to the Surface Transportation Board and also some of the AAR metrics. Um, so far, the answer to your question, Kevin, is I haven't seen it. The, 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 the service was strong last year. Service continues to be strong. The trains holding number, the rail cars idling number, they're both within the normal parameters. They're not veering off in any way. Fingers crossed it remains that way, but you know, besides the intermodal service scorecard that we'll talking that we'll talk about in a second, that uh, that data set that we put into our gold subscription is a way for our gold subscribers week after week to kind of get a real time look at whether service is trending to a normal year or whether it's veering towards a a, um, a congested market. Yeah, so let's get into the the service scorecard because that's uh, taking a more uh, comprehensive look and also diving deeper into the actual intermodal uh, marketing companies and and the the people who the shippers are working with directly. So, um, what? How long has that one been going on your end, and and how did you decide to put that together? So that's a relatively new thing. Our first year was last year, twenty twenty three. Uh, one of the reasons you know we did that is we did introduce this gold tier subscription. Uh, that's sort of a higher tier beyond the normal subscription at the Journal of Commerce. And so we want to be able to provide premium content that you don't get elsewhere. And so, you know, back to my last answer, being able to parse data and present it in a way that no one else has before, before to give real time look at service is a value add. And so this is another value add where um, we started this last year for the gold subscribers and the premise really behind it 
is very simple. That as much as I like the data that we just talked about in the last question, there's something missing. And the way it really kind of resonated in my head is that, you know, the railroads like to throw out this number on time performance or trip plan compliance, whichever term you want to okay. use. I say this with all due respect to the railroads. It's a nonsense term because every railroad has a different definition of what trip plan compliance is. And everybody has a different different buffer. And even different business lines have different buffers. The buffer that they consider on time for UPS business or reefer business is different than the standard dry intermodal business. And so there's no set standard by railroad and there's no set standard within intermodal itself. So it's it, to me, it's sort of a nonsense number on top of it, to the extent that they were reporting to the STV a buffer of 24 hours, my natural reaction would be, well, wait a second. If I dropped off my load 24 hours after the cutoff time, can I say to them, why didn't you take it? It's on time. You guys consider anything within a 24 hour buffer on time. Why don't I get that? Of course that wouldn't work. <laughs> the railroad would say, you're, you're 30 minutes late, you missed the cutoff. So right. the fact that they don't do that in some of their metrics, then sort of in my mind, I, I understand why they present it, but it sort of sullies the value of that data. So what I did was I said, all right, well, how do we go about getting a snapshot of service in a different way? And so what rung in my head was Norfolk Southern has said a number of times, and they're right, intermodal is a service. That's what we do. We provide a service. So I said to myself, okay, well, shippers are buying a service. You're, buy you're the Indian Mary for them, but ultimately it's a service that the, that the shippers are buying. Well, in my personal life, if I'm purchasing a service, I'm purchasing a service all the time. Around my home, I need the HVAC repaired. I need a plumbing job done. I need uh, something done to my fireplace, whatever it may be. And I know that, that I, thankfully, in this digital age, don't have to be randomly picking people out of what I'm, I, I guess the yellow pages doesn't really exist anymore, but I don't have to <laughs> randomly pick someone out of the yellow pages for a dated reference to, to do the work and just hope that my hard-earned money was spent wisely, I have these services like Angie's List and Home Advisor and in our area, Consumer Checkbook, where I can see who do my neighbors think is doing a good job. People who have had the same work that I need done, done before, who in my local area has done work for them that is considered highly rated. And so then I can go in with more confidence saying, okay, I know people in my county or my immediate neighborhood say company XYZ does a very good job, and I have a higher degree of confidence when hiring them that it will be done the right way the first time, and I won't be squandering my money. So we took the same premise here to Intermodal and said, okay, really the, the, the customers only want the same thing on Intermodal, and so we do two surveys. We send one out to the IMC, such as Intech, and we say, you guys are the immediate customer of the railroad, just like. I'm hiring again a plumber, an HVAC person, person for the for the fireplace. And so you know who's doing a good job and who's not doing a good job. And so we send out the survey, one of the two surveys to the IMCs and say, rate the railroads. Tell us who's doing the best, who's doing the worst. Rate them on these KPIs. Why is railroad A doing better than railroad B? Why is railroad C doing worse than railroad D? And then we compile all that data. We name who gets the best scores, we give scores for all the KPIs, and we give a really thorough look of who the IMCs are do, saying are doing the best and worst jobs, why, what areas of the country is one railroad potentially doing better than the other and why. And then we do a second survey, which I know you guys are very helpful on, in which we go to the shippers, who similarly have that relationship where you're their plumber, you're their HVAC person, you're the person fixing the fireplace. And we ask them the same thing. How satisfied are you with your IMC partners? Do you like Intech or other non-asset based IMCs? Do you like JB Hunt? Do you like Schneider? Do you like Hub? Do you like STG? Do you like Swift? Tell us who's doing the best job in your network and why. Tell us who's struggling and why. Rank them on these KPIs. What is the value of a non-asset IMC over a JB Hunt. What is the sell there that a non-asset IMC can make? So we gather all that data together. We have, you know, six class one railroads, and then we've got the, um, we've got, I guess, seven categories, six or seven categories of IMCs. Throw it all together, have a robust scorecard with a lot of, you know, percentages and a five-point scale and a net promoter score, all these 
you know, fancy terms that you use in customer satisfaction surveys. And we throw together a 30 page report twice a year that gives uh, the IMCs more information and also gives the shippers more information so that when they're making their purchasing decisions, whether it's shifting intermodal freight from one provider or another, or someone who's in the truckload space who wants to start intermodal conversions, they can go with some sense of confidence in their purchasing decision rather than just doing it blindly. Yeah, and the part that is is awesome about the um, the scorecard is is that um, up until this point, people are measuring you know the the service levels of the different railroads um, on intermodal, and it you're, you're, we're missing the point, which is intermodal is actually a three legged shipment. So when we're mm -hmm. just looking at the speeds of the trains, we're only measuring the speeds of the trains, and so based off of how the IMC performs on the origin, the destination dray, that brings together a service um, that that a stripper would be able to go ahead and say, hey, that's what that's exactly what we're getting in terms of uh, the service from IMC ABC or, or IMC Intech, um, because Rick, it fills that gap. And Rick, it's important to note that I've taken a painstaking effort to make sure that I have shippers grade the IMCs on only things that the IMC can control and have you right. grade the railroads and only thing the ra things that railroad controls. So I'm not going to ask a shipper to rank uh, Intech freight and logistics on transit performance when ultimately that's a function of your railroad partner. But at the same right. time, I can, I, I can very much ask the shipper to rank them on Intech in terms of on-time pickup or customer service or things that you directly control that have nothing to do with the actual train portion of it. And so we do take those efforts to make sure that the surveys of the IMCs are truly measuring the functions that are their functions that they right. do, and then measure the railroads and the functions that they do and not sort of pollute the two. Right, right, right. And so I mean, you mentioned the asset versus non-asset have with, without giving away all of the details of the report, um, uh, how are they sort of compared? How are people reacting uh, to the differences between uh, non-asset service typically and uh, the larger asset based ones? So much as I probably would have expected, um, we've got uh, categories such as um, equipment availability, pricing competitiveness, technology, again, on-time pickup, on-time delivery, customer service. And so in areas like equipment availability, which again, that pollutes a little bit because I get it. It's the, the railroads are controlling the UMAXs and EMPs. That's in it more because the asset guys you know, the, the private asset guys control their equipment. But, but, but the equipment availability, the pricing and accessorial fees, the technology, you know, be honest, the, the private guys do much better than the non-assets. And that's not a surprise. The technology that, uh, I'll try not to speak out of turn, but the technology provided by the class one railroads in terms of the rail loan boxes is not nearly as robust as the private guys have had for years and years and years. Railroads are catching up with GPS, but it's almost like, and I I again, say this with respect because I appreciate they're doing it, but they're welcome, you know, welcome to 2002 um, with that effort. It's nice they're doing it, but they're still far behind. So it's no surprise in technology and pricing and accessorial fees that the non-assets would be behind the, the big guys. You, you, I think, Rick, you've said this to me before, and I've heard it from many people. Any lane that J.B. Hunt wants, J.B. Hunt's going to get. So, you know, they, if they want a price, they're going to be able to beat anybody on price. But where the non-assets excel and do better than others are also the areas where I would expect it. Customer service, um, on-time pickup, on-time delivery in the sense that it's more controlled and it's not one driver out of 15,000 drivers. It's, it's a more uh, personalized experience. And so to the shipper who cares about the customer service and the on-time delivery, on-time pickup, the drayage portion of it, again, particularly the customer service metric, uh, the non-assets kick the living garbage out of every one of the private guys. And so to me, what I've gotten out of the first two surveys is that the non-asset IMC in my mind is very much sort of analogous to uh, a home improvement store in my area. I live outside of DC. And so we've got a Lowe's, we've got a Home Depot, but we also have a local hardware store. 
And so I know that there are different reasons why I would go to one or the other. And I go to all three of them for various reasons. And so if I'm simply interested in Christ, I don't need someone to teach me about something or give me any handholding. It's simply an item I know I want in Christ. I'm going to go home Depot or Lowe's. But if I'm buying an item where I need to talk to someone, someone who maybe even knows me or at least knows, you know, the air, the, the town I'm in because they're local and it's family owned business and I need handholding, then I'm going to go to the local, the local hardware store because I'm not going to get anyone with any knowledge from Home Depot or Lowe's because they're big box places. And so th that's the analogy in the sense that there's not necessarily uh, a person doesn't necessarily need to use one or the other. It's not mutually exclusive there is value to be added by both types of places. And so I shop at Lowe's, Home Depot, and a local hardware store based on my needs of any particular purchase. And similarly, what I would say in the domestic intermodal space is that, again, there is a purpose for the big guy who can deal on price. And there is a purpose of the non-asset community that's going to give you a much better customer service experience. And no shipper should really make it mutually exclusive where they go with one but not the other, they should do a little bit of everything and make their decisions based on what is the needs of that particular book of business, that book of freight. And even within freight, there's certain freight that is, um, you know, low value, low importance. And so that may go to a big asset guy because it's just pricing is really the only thing that matters. And then there's stuff that needs more nuanced, high customer service, high tracking, making sure nothing goes wrong. And that's a place where customer service is more important. And the non-asset potentially delivers a value that you wouldn't get from the private guys. So, you know, long story short, the survey is really trying to give a platform to have shippers know what are the strengths and weaknesses of the various types of intermodal providers, and then to look at their own supply chain and discover their needs and make the right decision based off of what their priorities are. Have you heard any feedback from from shippers having seen um, the the first couple out uh, now in terms of um, you know what direction has it prompted them to take any kind of different action that they uh, maybe were unaware that there was something better for them out there? Um, I'm not sure that has happened, but what I would say is the two things I've heard. Um, are that the more savvy shippers, and I'm thinking right now of a of a food shipper who's a huge intermodal uh, customer. And the way he put it to me, uh, I won't name name the company, but I'll mention the non asset IMC. It wasn't in tech, but but it was a, one of your brethren. And so he said to me, you know, I've got business with JB Hunt, and I've got business with Schneider, but I also have business with Cornerstone. And so. I know there, as I said in the last answer, there are reasons why you put stuff with Cornerstone, and then there are reasons why you put stuff with J.D. Hunt or Schneider, and he div divvies up his volume between the three, knowing that certain types of his business he wants having ha to have that handhold, um, that guidance, that person that you can reach at any time. Uh, and not just be a number. And then other times it's about price. So more and more as I do this, I think I'm realizing the savvy shippers do take that nuanced approach of not it, not all of it being just about price and not all of it being about service and have it being a mixture of both depending on the, the particular piece of freight. And then the second thing I'd say I'd learn, this is more, I would say, interesting and potentially humorous more than anything else, is that it seems like, at least through the first two surveys, that we've got people who like Schneider or Hub, but I don't really run across too many shippers who like Schneider and like Hub. Mm -hmm. Usually they tend to, I don't know if that's your experience, but usually I, people tell me, I like Schneider and hate Hub, or I love, Schne I lo love Hub and hate Schneider. So they really, really like one, and they really, really dislike the other. Sometimes maybe I hear a blah for both, but I've never heard anyone say, I like both of them. And it's interesting because the numbers really show it's relatively equal where you've got customers, uh, as many customers who love Hub, hate Schneider as love Schneider, hate Hub. Um, you know, I'll pick companies that are very public about their partnerships, you know, and Ashley Furniture or Nestle, who, you know, very clearly Hub customers love Hub and, and 
you know, I, I won't say they specifically have told me that they don't touch Schneider, but they're mm -hmm. in that pro, that pro hub uh, category. But then if you think of, you know, another company that's that's out there as a, a Schneider customer, Sanmar, uh, John Jansen, I know you guys know him well. He loves Schneider. And, I, and, and he's never said to me, I would never touch hub group, but I think he would fall into that category of, of love Schneider, don't like hub. And so that is an interesting thing that it seems to me that that shippers, you know, may pick JB Hunt for a portion of their freight, but when they go to, you know, second or third aside from the non-asset, they tend to want to pick either Schneider or Hub, but not necessarily both. Not I'm not sure why it is. I just know that through the first two surveys that's happened and through my conversations with a lot of domestic intermodal shippers, that seems to be a consistent thing. I take, by the way, I take no debate, sides right? in it. I take no sides in it because <laughs> I know, you know, obviously through this, through covering intermodal, I've got a lot of good people I talk to at Schneider and a lot of people I talk to at Hub Group. So I'm not suggesting in any way one is better than the other. I'm just simply observing for whatever reason that the, the shippers seem to never like both of them and like one and dislike the other equally in both directions. Mm -hmm. Well, your comments in terms of non-asset and the large asset players in the um, intermodal space, we see that all the time where we'll be sitting on the same same docks, we'll be in, in the same trailer pools as, say, a J.B. Hunt. Um, and it's really split on what you're saying, a more savvy shipper, um, more um, customized lanes or more lanes that have um, – you know, appointed deliveries and you, you need to have additional reporting for them. Um, th that tends to be the the sweet spot for for the non-asset IMCs for sure. Um, that and the smaller and medium-sized shippers, which typically don't have enough volume out there to entice a large um, intermodal provider to say, hey, this is a place that I want to be doing business with because it, it just doesn't fit their model. Each model is is very, has, has its pluses and minuses. So, um, so the next one, so we'll see how this plays out. So your next uh, survey is going to come out when? So we haven't formally launched a date. My guess is it'll probably be at some point in April. My hope is early April, maybe mid to late April, because as we talked we talk about the intermodal savings index at the beginning. And so once, once we hit the end of a quarter, which obviously is the last day of March, you know, all steam ahead in terms of me producing that, that Q1 intermodal savings index report. And then as soon as that's done, that, then we can get to launching the survey. So all depends on that. But I fully expect that at some point in April, we will be launching that survey. And we usually leave it open for about six to eight weeks to let the IMCs fill it out, have IMCs such as yourself send it out to your shippers and be able to gather all those responses and then you know crunch out a report from there. So for people that um, would like to participate in the, the data gathering so they can also get a piece of what's going on and get an understanding, how will they be able to find that? So one of the things I, it's a long-winded answer to grapple with is, is the anonymity part of it, and I get it. Um, shippers, even IMCs, you know, I understand that they don't want they worry that their opinions will be tied to them and that it will be known. And so we send out links that are anonymous in nature. I mean, we offer links that do track, but we also send off links that are anonymous in nature. And so the vast majority, I would say, of our respondents are um, anonymous in nature. And that's totally fine. That's how it works. And so shippers you know, can work through either contacting me directly at the Journal of Commerce um, and you can find me on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever it may be and send me a message and say you're interested and I can send you the link directly or you, you reach out to your IMC such as Intech Freight and Logistics and, and they can provide you a link to fill it out. Um, you know, the, the one thing I would let the shippers know that the downside is anonymity is important, but at the same time, then you have to go to Intech and make sure that if you filled it out, you follow up with them so they can send you a copy of the final report because I know Rick is helping me out and I know the Intech team is helping me out. Uh, but to the extent that we have a lot of shippers and last time we had almost 250 shippers that filled out, you know, they're anonymous. I don't know who they are. So the downside of being anonymous is I don't really have that list to be able to directly send the report to, but it is a valuable report. You guys have spent your time on it. You deserve to get this product, which is sold to other people free of charge. And so 
I would say if you want to be anonymous, that's totally fine. Um, and if it's not through me, then just make sure you work with your IMC so that after you fill it out, that you follow up with them and get a copy of the report once it's out. Excellent. Well, and speaking of uh, the paid versions of, of both reports that we talked about, uh, how can people go about uh, accessing uh, a gold a subscription? Sure. So everything we've talked about from the intermodal savings index and intermodal service scorecard uh, and some of the data we talked about earlier with the STD and AAR data all available under the gold subscription. So you go to our website, which is joc.com, joc.com, click on subscribe. I believe the link is, but please don't hold me to this if this turns out <laughs> being wrong when you type this into your computer. I believe it's joc.com backslash subscribe. That would get you to the subscribe page. And then we have uh, three tiers, uh, a platinum level, a uh, silver level, which is the historic one we had in the past, and then the gold. And the gold is the one that has access to this uh, material. And then on top of it, a gold subscription also gives you access to me because there are a lot of people out there that um, read the report and say, hey, you know, I want to know more about Los Angeles to Chicago or more about Los Angeles to Dallas. And with 120 lanes, I simply can't write a report that goes into the granular details of each one of those 120 lanes. But to the extent that you see one of our reports as a gold subscriber and have a question about a specific lane, or you have a specific question about a specific railroad or an IMC, again, not being able to, in a 30-page report, cover every data point that we have, the gold subscription gives you access to me that I can send you whatever data you may need uh, in order to answer your questions. I'm happy to help any gold subscriber be able to get the granular level of detail of information on pricing and or service that they need from me. And finally, one more thing, since we talked about uh, TPM, about, yeah. about, what, six months or so uh, until your next big event uh, inland. So uh, where can people follow that and uh, start to look at getting registered, uh, things like that? Sure. So our registration will open probably right towards the end of March uh, for people who are not familiar. So at the beginning, we talked about how TPM is essentially the ocean industry and the ports and inland is what it says it's really everything after the port but more importantly it's really our uh, ability to bring the same level of granular content of what matters to the shipper um, through the prism of intermodal and so now at this conference we talk about 2040s but we talk about 53 foot intermodal we talk about truckload we talk about dry van we talk about reefer we talk about ltl we talk about parcel but again with that same level of focus that we do at tpm that's focused on the issues that matter to the shippers the people that are paying these freight bills for 53 foot intermodal or truckload or ltl or parcel so the conference is at the end of september it's always at the end of september this year it's september 30th october 1 october 2 at the weston river north hotel in chicago uh, on the north side of chicago we will uh, be posting information. And again, I apologize if this is not the right link. <laughs> you can go to joc.com and click on events. I believe the link is joc.com slash events. But if you type in on a, any search engine, you know, like Google JOC events, then it should come up and that will provide you access on how you can buy a ticket to the event, um, the rates for the event, buy a ticket to the event, the agenda as we post it. Uh, hopefully within the next 60 days, we'll have an agenda out there, but it will be very much shipper focused. And, you know, I'll be talking to, to you guys, you know, offline and, and a lot of domestic intermodal shippers over the next 30 to 60 days to hear about what is on their mind so that we can develop an agenda that has both you guys and your customers out there looking at it and saying, wow, there are things on there that pique my interest that are talking about things that are on my mind that are issues that matter to me. Uh, so we're going to do a lot of conversations uh, you know, privately over the next 30 to 60 days to really flesh out that agenda in a way that it delivers value to anyone that's buying a ticket. Great, Ari, thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank Happy you as do. always. Happy to do it. Thanks very much for joining us for InTech Freight and Logistics, the podcast. Rick, we uh, we did it. First video in the books. We did. Year later, 30 episodes later, and we're, we're good to go. Yeah, we uh, really appreciate having Ari Ash join us. Uh, third time guests. So um, check out the links in the description to learn more about uh, everything we discussed on the podcast. And uh, 
if you are watching on YouTube, which is the only way you could be watching, uh, subscribe to our channel and uh, get all of our videos as soon as we put them out. If you're listening, then uh, please do subscribe or follow us wherever you're listening and uh, drop us a comment or a review or both, even better. And uh, we'd appreciate that. So uh, for now, for Rick, I'm Kevin. We'll talk to you next time. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.